I want to talk with you about the sacred heart of our divine Lord. But before I begin my sermon, I want to tell you a story. And this story is a true story. As you know, I'm sure, in the old church, before that disastrous Vatican Council destroyed Roman Catholicism, in the old church, in the days of the old church, the most Catholic country in the world was Spain. In Spain, everybody was at least in name a Roman Catholic. 99.99% of the people were Roman Catholics. It was impossible to find anybody except foreigners in Spain of any other religion. It's true there were many Spaniards who didn't go to church. But if you asked them what they were, they would always say Roman Catholic. They'd been baptized Roman Catholic. They'd probably received their first communion as Roman Catholics. They would were married as Roman Catholics, because the only marriages valid in Spain were Roman Catholic marriages. And they would be buried as Roman Catholics. So it was the most intensely Roman Catholic country in the world. But in 1936, a great civil war broke out in Spain. And that war lasted for three years, until just the eve of the great Second World War. And Spain was divided into two camps. There were the conservative Spaniards, who were Catholic, and then there was the other half of the nation, which had turned violently against the Catholic Church, and which was influenced strongly by Freemasonry, by Communism, and by secular liberalism. And so that was one of the most cruel wars in all history. And it was responsible for killing one million human beings. Now in that war, the churches of Spain were desecrated. The holy images were taken out. If they got into the church before the priests had a chance to get the sacrament out, they broke, it over, they broke open the tabernacle, they despoiled the host, gave it the dogs to eat, and all that sort of thing. And Spain became a country filled with sacrilege. And at the exact geographical center of Spain, which was about 14 kilometers to the south of Madrid, the capital, there was a hill. And that hill was called the El Cerro de los Angeles, the Hill of the Angels. That was the exact geographical center of the Spanish nation. And so back at the beginning of this century, the Spanish government had built there a huge statue, four or five times life-size, of the Sacred Heart of our Divine Lord, with the Holy Sacred Heart exposed and using the statue. And the papal legate came from Rome as a representative of the Pope, and Spain was consecrated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And that became a great center of devotion in Spain. So during the Spanish Civil War, several regiments of Spanish red militia were stationed in that area. That was their camp. And this area around the Statue of the Sacred Heart became a place which was used for target practice. And the target was the heart of our Lord on the statue. And daily they came there in hundreds and shot their rifles and their machine guns at the sacred heart of our Lord. And finally, so much was fired at the statue of our Lord that the statue broke in two at the heart and crumbled and fell. Then after the war, after the Spanish Civil War was over, and the Reds had been vanquished, the Spanish government rebuilt that statue of the Sacred Heart, and a legate came from Rome as a representative of the Pope, and the country was again consecrated to the Sacred Heart. So that is a story that illustrates 
what in the old church, before the destruction of Roman Catholicism, what the devotion to the Sacred Heart meant. I'm sure that all of you here today who are over 30 or 35 will remember the first Fridays in the old church. How the churches were packed with people every first Friday of every month. And how the evening before, lines of people waited to get into the confessional to confess their sins. And the tremendous devotion that the Sacred Heart inspired until next Friday is the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a great festival for all Roman Catholic, all true Roman Catholic people. And on that day, I hope that all of us will renew our dedication and our consecration to our Blessed Lord's Sacred Heart. Now, the Sacred Heart of our Lord, with the heart of our Lord exposed, as in the statue here, illustrates to us in a very graphic way the love that our blessed Lord has for us. His heart palpitates and beats for us in heaven. His love comes out for us. And it is the love of Christ that makes each one of us worthwhile. Remember this, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of talk in the world today by people who don't believe in any form of religion about civil rights and about the dignity of man. Well, that's all right. We believe as, as Catholics, we believe in the dignity of man. But the thing that makes each one of us worthwhile, the thing which gives to each one of us dignity, is the fact that God loves us. That we're in his image. And that we're recipients of his sacred love. That is what gives to each one of us dignity. That is what makes each one of us truly human, and what makes us the sons of God. So the feast of the Sacred Heart is a feast of the love which our blessed Lord has for each one of us. Just as the feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is the feast which illustrates the love that she as our Immaculate Mother has for us. You know, in our society today, our modern civilization, love is the theme that is perhaps most common, undoubtedly most common. If you turn on the t television at random, you'll see some film or something there illustrating some point about love. All of our films, all of our novels, almost everything that is created today somehow, directly or indirectly, deals with the theme of love. The songs that we hear on the radio, the songs that we hear in the street, or on television, or in theaters, the songs are almost all of them concerned with love. They always have been. Love is the very basic uh, element in human existence. And yet, love is one of the most misunderstood things in the world. Unless one receives the divine revelation from God, it is impossible to understand what love is. Only as Christians, as followers of Christ, can love be understood fully. Now, there are two aspects of love. There's an earthly side to it, and there's a heavenly side. There's a fleshly side, and there's a spiritual side. There is a side of love which is connected with our flesh, and there is a side of love which is connected with our destiny in heaven. So love is always, it has that twofold character. Now in our modern world today, the emphasis is almost entirely on the fleshly side of human love. People today profess not to believe, many people, in the divine love of, uh, aspect of love at all. They scoff when you talk to them about that element of love. They're only willing to believe in love which is connected with the flesh. In other words, love in connection with sex. Our modern civilization is drunk on sex. Sex has become the religion of modern, secularized men. In that respect, our society today is very like that of the times of the Apostles. St. Paul, as he traveled around the early world, everywhere he found temples. 
dedicated to Seth. The, uh, the various cults that revolved around the goddess Diana, or Venus, that uh, revolved around female deities in general, were all temples of sex. In connection with the great temple in Ephesus, which St. Paul attacked so bitterly, there was a, a house of prostitutes. The temples had temple prostitutes. And so, in that age too, the worship of the people was largely in terms of sex. Worshipping these deities who were goddesses of fertility. So that age, too, was drunk on sex, just as our modern society is. And so this theme of sex permeates our modern life. And it destroys any true conception of love that there might be. One of the most wicked things in Western countries today is the billion-dollar industry of pornography. All of you know how widespread pornography is in the world in which we live. For every, whenever you go into a drugstore or into a store, that's a bookstore, you look at the magazines there and you'll find a great many of them concerned with raw pornography, with suggestive pictures which try to emphasize and promote the feelings and the passions of the flesh. And as I say, that is a tremendous vested interest in our society today, pornography. It's corrupting our youth. It's undermining the very bastions of our society and our civilization. And the horribly wicked thing is that to add fuel to these flames, they've invented this horrible thing of sex education in the school. Now, this sex education in the school, which sounds so nice in theory, is just another form of dirty, dirty pornography. And one of the worst things I know, one of the worst condemnations of the conciliar church, the Nevis Ordo Church, is the fact that in its schools it is promoting this dirty kind of sex instruction. And a very large number, a very, very high number of the people who are teaching that dirty sex instruction are none. At least they call themselves none. They're nuns of the pearl and blue rinse type. You know the kind I mean. And states up to here. <laughs> they are parading. And our children, in going to their schools, are victims of this sort of thing, promoted by, very largely by nuns. So we live in this sort of society. So in this sort of society, in this sort of pagan, secular civilization, it is impossible to get away from this awful campaign against true love. And to add also to the, uh, more fuel to the flames, we have television, which pumps this filth into our living room. Now, I watch television. I have a television set. I watch the ABC News. I watch public broadcasting. Occasionally, I watch some film that I know is going to be a good one. And occasionally I watch just to see what some of these films are like. And I know that some of the most popular films today are deliberately trying to undermine the morals of this country. I'll name you two or three examples. One of them is this film, MASH. I wonder if you, I'm sure all of you have seen the film, MASH. Well, now, in this film, MASH, there is a constant attempt to talk about sex in a dirty way. It is one of the most wicked things I know of on television. A few years ago, there was another film called Moab. Now, Moab was very funny. I watched Maud on a number of occasions, and Maud was very witty. I laughed. But the most pernicious thing I have ever seen on television was on that thing, Maud. And that was pro-abortion propaganda. Some of you may have seen it. It was a horror. Now, children all over this country watch Maud. It's very popular with children. I've seen very small children watching that. There are many others that I could name. You could name them probably better than I do. Because I don't watch television a great deal. I want, I chiefly use it to hear President Reagan's speeches, of which I highly approve you. And um, of the ABC News, of which I don't approve you. But uh, at any rate, uh, television is one of the things we have to watch. 
But remember that there is a concerted attempt in this country and in all other Western Christian countries to destroy the whole conception of Christian love. What is love? Our Lord taught us what love is. Just a look at this statue shows us what love is. The first element in real love is self-sacrifice, the idea of giving of oneself to another person. That is true love, the idea of self-sacrifice. That is the love which the gospel of Christ emphasizes. Greater love hath no man than this, he says in the gospel of St. John, than a, that a man lay down his life for his friend. That idea of giving, even to one's life, in love. That is real love. The idea of self-sacrifice. That is the idea that the saints have practiced and taught. That is the whole theme of the gospel. Love in that sense of self-sacrifice. Now, Sex is not to be despised. The flesh is not to be despised. That is part of love. That is part of the whole thing. But that is only part of it. And the underlying reality of love lies in the idea of self-sacrifice. He who loves us most is the one who gave himself for us on the cross. And the saints of God have been those who have followed that theme of love. One can think of the saints of many of the saints, and how in their own lives they have practiced this type of love, love as primarily self-sacrifice. Think of, I've talked to, uh, about uh, him to you in this church, Father David, the leper priest, who went out to the island of Molokai as a young man in the Pacific Ocean. And there on that island, in a leper colony, he gave his whole life to the service of these lepers. He said mass for them. He heard their confession. When they needed him, he went there and was with them. If they were dying, he would sleep beside them and minister to them and comfort them and dip a rag in water and put it on their burning forehead. Think of that. That was love. Love as self-sacrifice. And finally he became a leper for their sake. One of the most wonderful things that I can remember, and I've repeated it, I know, in this church before, was that Sunday when Father Damien stood up in the pulpit of his little church and instead of beginning his sermon on that Sunday with the words which he usually began it with, my dear leper brethren, that Sunday he held out his arms to them and he said, we lepers. He had become a leper for their sake. So if you want to understand love, look at the leprous hands of Father Damien with the flesh falling off. Look at his poor face with the face, the, all the flesh rotting on it, one eye already gone. That is love. Look at St. Francis of Assisi. Beautiful, lovely St. Francis. Think of him as a young man decked in his silks and his satins and his jewels and his finery, riding a fine horse and seeing a filthy leper beside the road. And moved by some sudden impulse, he got down from his horse and took off his fine clothes and gave him to the leper, and he put on the filthy, germ-infested rags of the leper. Look at St. Francis. In his holiness and his greatness of love, he received the actual wounds of our Lord into his hands. And he received the Holy Spirit. Think of his bleeding hands, the bleeding hands of St. Francis. That is another sign of love, in his true and self-sacrificing sense. Look at St. Teresa, the little flower. In these years, after the coughing spell, sat up three nights and thinking only in terms of what she would do from heaven, how she would spend her heaven doing good upon earth, how after she was dead and in heaven, she would let fall upon the earth a shower of roses. There again is love. You can see it in her lovely eyes and in her beautiful hands, holding the crucifix of Christ and her roses. That again is Christian love. That is the love of Christ. That is the love of self-sacrifice. Think of the cure d'art, St. John Marie Vianney, a poor priest in a tiny village of France, living on potatoes, giving all of his money, every penny he had, to other people, sitting there 14, 15, 16, 18 hours a day, hearing confession. 
being able to look into the very eyes of the sinners and tell them exactly what sins they committed and what their problems were. Living his obscure life there, a life of penurious suffering on behalf of other people. There again, in the eyes of that holy French priest, we see the love of Christ. This is the love which comes from the sacred heart of Jesus. All true love comes from him. The love which comes into a marriage and makes that marriage wonderful and good and happy and peaceful is love which comes from the sacred heart. And any marriage which is not based upon that love of Christ and the idea of self-sacrifice, of one giving oneself to the other, is a marriage which is in danger of failure. And there again, that is a disease of our modern society. Because love has gone wrong, it's gone sour, our society is failing, our civilization is coming. And so when we come to the Feast of the Sacred Heart, we should dedicate ourselves again as Roman Catholics, we must do so, to the Sacred Heart of our Divine Lord. To realize in our own minds the love that he has for us and the love that we must have for others. And to try to base our lives upon that love which comes from his heart. I had the privilege a few weeks back of being here with you in this congregation, in this church, on the darkest and blackest of all days of the Catholic year. That Friday which we call forever good. That black and terrible Friday of pain, which nevertheless is the Friday of our redemption. And we thought from the hours of twelve to the hour of three, that we know two hours, we thought upon the passion of Christ. We thought upon that terrible suffering, that welter of hideous pain which was inflicted upon him. We tried to think here together of the slaps that he received on his sacred face, of the kicks that he received when he fell under the heavy weight of the cross. We thought of his choking agony there on the cross, and how they pelted him with insults and spits and stones. We thought of the sufferings of his blessed mother, and of him when he saw her there at the cross, when he saw her on the way to Calvary, standing there at what is now the fourth station of the cross, and she had a spasm of pain when she saw her. We thought of all those things. That is love. That is the truth, the height, the depth, the fullness of love. Love can be found in its fullness only in the sacred heart of Jesus and in the immaculate heart of his ever-blessed mother. And so the feast of the sacred heart comes. And let us turn our eyes toward that warmest of all hearts, that heart which beats ever with our heart, that heart which is the fount of love, and that heart which is our destiny. Our lives in this world are frail and fragile. We all of us here in this world will have and are having a considerable share of pain and disappointment. There are many enemies of human life. There's disease. Cancer stops our land. Heart trouble. All the other diseases of modern civilized living. They can strike at any one of us and at any moment. And then finally all of us come to that greatest and most terrifying of all experiences, the dissolution of our bodies, when we have to go out into the dark. So let us put our hearts, let us put our affections in that one and that one only place where there is security, and that is in the sacred heart of our divine Lord. Let us as Roman Catholics, as true professors uh, professing the faith of our Lord and of his holy church, let us turn to his sacred heart and cry with full hearts, Cor Yesu Sacratissimum Miserere Me. Sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy upon me. Upon me.